Okay. okay. All right. So welcome everyone to um, the Siam Financial Math Virtual Seminar Series. Um, today we are uh, doing something a little different, um, which is a panel discussion uh, on a broad topic, energy market. So you've seen um, in the crisis that's been going on for the last three months, um, there have been a lot of consequences, um, not least in commodity um, and energy markets with things such as negative prices of oil and various things happening um, with uh, electricity demand and so on. Um, so the idea of this uh, panel is not so much to talk about uh, finished research, um, but to sort of spur a discussion on potentially new problems um, and new uh, incidents that are going on in the market and how um, research and teaching in this area might be impacted. Um, so I'll ask to start with um, each of the four panelists to uh, speak for about five minutes on, on uh, various topics that they think is, are of interest um, in this area in the current time. Um, and then I would like to open up, this will sort of be successful if um, um, there is a good amount of interaction as, as, as much as we can have on this format. Um, so please, uh, if you'd like to ask a question, um, uh, after the four initial presentations, uh, then uh, please type it in. Type that you would like a, to ask a question into the chat, and then we'll call on you to um, uh, to ask your question. Okay. So without further ado, uh, let me uh, start with Rene Aid, who is a uh, professor of economics at uh, University of Paris Dauphine, and previously was head of research and development at Electricité de France. Rene, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Roni. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, I'm going to do, okay, just uh, this one. And uh, so I guess that, voila. and I, I have, yes. Yeah, so thank you a lot for this invitation. And so there is, so I'm going to, to, to talk just a little about the French electricity market and the lockdown. Alors, I think I have my, my mic is open or? Yep, that's good. Yes, okay. Uh, Okay, so I just want to give some information about that and maybe it's going to interest people. Uh, and so as many other markets, uh, so in France to give you a hint of the situation. So in fact, the lockdown started on March 16th and it ended in May 11th. So it lasted roughly two months. And uh, here is the, 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 the trajectory of the weekly spot prices, the average weekly spot price from uh, week one, S stands for semaine, week. Uh, so week one was in January and uh, the 17 was uh, three months later. And you see that in fact here the price which started in January uh, at around 40 euro per megawatt hour uh, at, the, at the end of the week is, is less than 10 and it is it was five euro per megawatt hour, per megawatt hour. and many days uh, there were occurrence of uh, a negative price, but during a, a whole period of the day, not just one spike like this negative, a whole period of day. I'm going to show that just, uh, just in, a, in, a few, in a few minutes. But the thing is, the, the, the thing which is uh, very particular also, and so there was also strong impact on consumption uh, if you want to see, I got here, uh, just uh, for instance, you have to figure out that the, roughly the consumption in France is around 63 gigawatt at the peak in January. So it's winter months, it's very consuming uh, period. And uh, during the lockdown, it went down to, I think the least was uh, 41 gigawatt. So there was a cut by between 15 and, uh, and 20 percent. And uh, the thing that uh, drives people a little, uh, there's a, t a little tension here in France is because in France there is a special mechanism uh, called the AREN, the Regulated Access to Historical Nuclear Energy, and it's a device provided by the regulator so that a uh, new electricity provider can have access to the, uh, uh, to the cheap uh, nuclear energy uh, because of past, past investment. And so the electricity providers, they can ask EDF to deliver energy at a definite price at 42 euro per megawatt hour. So it's fact, it's a call on the calendar of the next year. And you have in fact three uh, exercise date. 
when, when you're going to say, okay, next year I want to have this amount of energy and it's my right and it's a free right. Uh, and the last exercise date is uh, for, oh no, it, there's a mistake for, for this year, 2020. It was in November, 2019. So there is a, it's always like this. In November, last call for the next year. And in November, it was there, November 19, the French price of electricity, it was really high. So 42 is there and it was like uh, 48. So everybody rushed out and wanted to, to get its RN. But then there was a lockdown. And so for March and April, people were very long uh, with something that they bought at 42, but the, the spot market crashed. And so they, and there was no demand whatsoever. The demand reduced. And so they were long in a depressed market. And, and so they, they, they complained a lot. And it, it led a lot of retailers to, to in fact invoke uh, the uh, force majeure situation and say, no, 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 we, we should be exempted for delivery to, we should be exempted from taking delivery. And so there are a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, trials between EDF and, its, uh, and, and the other suppliers uh, uh, because of this. And I think that the question is interest here is, are there other future markets where people invoked the force majeure, the act of God to say that they cannot deliver or they don't want to, to take delivery. So thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, uh, Renee. Um, so um, let's go to the next panelist and then um, we'll, we'll get through the introductions and, and move to questions uh, after, after that. So next. Uh, I have to, yes, I stopped sharing my screen. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so next we have uh, Zef Lokandwala who's um, been a market specialist in oil markets and other energy markets at Bloomberg for a number of years. Um, so Zef, thank you for uh, being on the panel. Let me turn it over to you. Much, uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak to all of you. And I wanna to talk to you about uh, essentially the situation that uh, drove oil prices into negative territory. And uh, I'm gonna share my screen over here. Uh, so essentially, you know, as I'm sure it's no secret, you saw oil volatility uh, jump to unprecedented levels. And uh, so oil precisely went negative on April 20th. And if you look at the pricing on April 17th at the close, it was 1827. Then on April 20th, which is a Monday, it opened at 10 a.m. at 1169. And at 2.08 is when it went negative. It basically fell to minus one cent. And in the next 22 minutes between 2.08 p.m. and 2.30 p.m., it fell to uh, minus 37.63 with a low of about $40. And by 8 p.m., that same day on April 20th, it was back up to positive territory to plus one and plus one penny, that is. And by the close on Tuesday, April 21st, when it expired, it went out at 10.01. And this is obviously uh, showing you extreme volatility conditions. And, uh, and essentially the margin amount uh, that you have to put up in this situation, you can see that this is an extremely high level. You have to put up $9,900 per contract and each crude oil contract is 1,000 barrels. And uh, so essentially you're putting up $9.90 a barrel to put on this exposure that was supposed to be the margin amount even if the price of oil was down to a penny. Uh, and uh, there were a lot of, uh, there were some system failures here, but not uh, without expecting, uh, no one expected negative prices, primarily interactive brokers had a big problem. But to look at the actual impact of negative oil prices, I'm gonna jump right to the punchline here and tell you that it wasn't really that big of a deal to the, uh, to the real market. It was more like an anomaly of sorts combined with system failures that drove the prices to an extreme situation. So on April 20th, the open interest in the May contract, uh, which was about to expire, uh, was about 108,000 lots. And each lot, again, is 1,000 barrels of oil. So you're talking about roughly 108 million barrels of oil was the uh, open interest in that contract as it was about to go negative. Uh, but you also, if you look closely, there was a big trade among the physical players in calendar spread options. 
So essentially, that May June spread. The uh, if if you if you essentially wanted to put out a short position in oil, when uh, uh, you uh, you essentially if you were to short futures, it would be an expensive short simply because of the amount of margin you'd have to put up. So essentially, the, the especially physical players very quickly figured out that the best way to put on a short was to buy in the money CSO puts. And that open interest was roughly 63 and a half thousand contracts. And so that offset a significant portion of the 108 or so contracts that uh, were showing as open interest. So essentially these were directly offset, uh, they, the, these were in the money CSO puts directly offset by futures length with no economic uh, relevance really in that sense. And uh, so uh, there's also something, you know, there's the TAS market, the trade at settlement market. So typically uh, the ETFs, the USO type ETFs and, you know, various financial products, they tend to roll at settlement. So essentially you can choose to put on your order in the beginning of the day to trade at settlement. And that typically historically has been maybe a penny or two off uh, the you know the the final price and it's been a very very tiny variation for a very very long time, but because of the situation that amount blew out to more like ten times that uh, typical differential, and and it also turns out that a big participant on the long side it was uh, through a Bank of China retail investor product called Yuan Yu Bao, which literally translated means crude oil treasure. And they were holding positions going right into the expiry. So, and apparently the Bank of China uh, uh, ate some of those losses. But essentially, the the actual investor interest that was hurt by negative oil prices was confined to some retail people who decided to try to buy oil when it was almost zero, uh, putting up very little margin. And that was a failure on the part of the systems of interactive brokers. So essentially, at a penny, they assumed you could lose no more than a penny and asked you to only put up a penny when really the margin amount was closer to you know, $9.90. And because of that, some unusually large positions were uh, unintentionally put on. And so these system failures are not likely to reoccur. And uh, we still have a situation where essentially you have negatively, uh, you have negative strike options that are now listed on the CME. Uh, and uh, in terms of modeling these and pricing these, you'd have to switch from a log normal distribution to a normal distribution, which breaks down historical comparisons. And I'm not sure there is a good answer on how to handle negative strike oil prices and it's unclear if you know that situation might ever occur again let's assume it's less likely to occur than it uh, did in the, the last time uh, due to some of the remedies that have been put in place but it's definitely not impossible that you might have have the situation again so that was like a quick overview on uh, some of the gory details of what drove negative oil prices and the fact that it wasn't terribly relevant to the uh, you know to most of the financial uh, to most of the financialists physical players simply uh, because it was a small volume it was a nice headline and it was kind of disconnected from the economic fundamentals of the contract. With that, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Seth. That's, that's extremely interesting, um, and we'll come back to that topic, I'm sure. Um, let me introduce. It's a pleasure to introduce our next panelist, Glenn Swindle, who's managing partner at Scoville Risk partners and has had a, a long career both in the industry and in academia before that. Um, so with that, uh, let me turn it over to Glenn. It's great to have you here. Great. Yeah, thanks for having me. Let me um, uh, share a screen here also. Um, and I'm off mic. Uh, so um, uh, this is going to be like a compliment to what Renee uh, uh, described, sort of the US version, if you will. Um, Quantity risk uh, it pervades the commodities business, but it's often sort of unheralded in the sense that maybe because it's not diffusive, maybe because you're only worried about how much a solar panel will generate year by year for financing or how much a customer short position will use, <clears throat> it, it, it's, it's, it, it ostensibly averages out to, you know, sort of a central limit thing where you have pretty good forecasts, except when it doesn't. So uh, this is a picture of uh, kind of continuing in Renee's vein, New York City hourly load 
Um, it, uh, the, the, the red part starts in mid-November as a kind of an artifact of how we look at things. But you, know, you can see right away, it's noisy, a lot of risk, and a lot of averaging. Um, and you know, if you just look at the blue part, there's actually a slight negative trend there as efficiency or demand response, various things have occurred to, uh, to, to alter the, the dynamic of load. But, um, uh, and so you can't see that from the naked eye, but what you can certainly see from the naked eye, and that's what's in, uh, astonishing about this epic, is that uh, it's clearly something dreadful has occurred and occurred quite rapidly. Um, the way people look at this is they regress it and model it with sort of arbitrary levels of sophistication, first driver being temperature. This is temperature, LaGuardia on the x-axis, this load average for on-peak buckets on the, on the y-axis. And the red is the same red you see here. So you see like in mid-November, you're cruising right up through December, nice winter sort of peak occurring, and then kablooey you end up with uh, uh, dramatic shortfalls of very similar magnitude to what Rene, Rene was mentioning. Now, the, um, we do this, we push this out almost on a daily basis around the country. Here's a sample of a few. This basically the experiment that you can imagine is this. If you go back and calibrate your model starting, stopping right about here, and then feed all of the inputs, the seasonality, drifts, temperatures, and the like, and then ask what was the actual load less that, you can see that things went pear-shaped very rapidly. Um, uh, this is New York. This is New York sans the, uh, the sort of greater New York City area. Uh, for contrast, Texas, uh, MISO South is, uh, you should think of that as Louisiana, and MISO Central, you should think of that as Michigan. They all reacted differently. New York clearly hit first, and then it rippled through the system. Um, now, the, the one thing I wanted to say, to, to, to add a little bit to Renee's comment, is that um, in the U.S., a lot of times, you're, you're, it's, it's not that you're buying from EDF necessarily, you're, you're, you're purchasing from dealers. So retailers here have the exact same problem that Renee referred to. You have a fixed price contract from somebody, it could be Shell, it could be BP, and ultimately, when this sort of demand destruction occurs, it hurts because you're long in a falling environment. But... There's another feature that's often not known, which is that with low energy prices, other costs that are fixed, like capacity, we can talk about that at some point if, if needed, but just think of it as a big old fixed cost that retailers try to extract by a volumetric payment. When the volume goes down, you don't extract that fixed cost, so you get cream twice, not just with the extra length on a falling price environment, but you're not even recouping fixed costs that are essentially immutable. Um, now, for modeling purposes, it happens so quickly that there's been a huge aggravation as far as just trying to keep the wheels on the wagon for forecasting. And so this is just a quick picture. We have our own adjustments to COVID. They're somewhat arbitrary, I must confess, but to give you an idea of the magnitude, if we were looking at yesterday from the point of view of the day before, all the bells and whistles, every single thing you can throw at this, yesterday's humidity, today's humidity, you know, the, the full Monty properly trained, uh, this is what you would have thought when you when you make sort of a heuristic COVID adjustment. This is what happens. The actual is yellow and our forecast is orange. I didn't cherry pick this. The forecast ain't great, but you can see the idea of the magnitude. Um, not to burn through too much time, but there are stylized facts out there about how patterns have changed as people have gone home and, and worked less or had a slightly more relaxed environment. They get up later and you can sort of see the business as usual load of growth in the first few hours was basically shifted back by an hour. That's the second plot. In other words, the bankers are, are, are setting the alarm clock a little later. Uh, all of that affects the way the electricity markets work when the rubber hits the road at the hourly level. Because if you can't get this right, it's hard to know what you're actually gonna try to do uh, both for your hedging purposes as well as what the uh, electricity markets are doing. Now, finally, for comparison, just a couple of quick slides. I had to I apologize for this. I pulled this from a book I wrote because I didn't want to reconstruct it, but this was what happened in the credit crisis. It's at a monthly level. And you can see that, look at the lower plot, basically same type of units, percent shortfall. It took from when things started to go wrong easily a year before you started to see anything near 10%, let alone 20%. So it's, this was anything but an adiabatic change where you could train your models and adapt to things and sort of function. Um, if you compare now, and this I, I found interesting, the sell-off of commodities prices, this is US-centric, but WTI could argue is coupled to some extent, 
All prices normalized at one starting in July, a massive sell off, something like 15 to 60% across all commodities. Now, interestingly, the crude oil collapse, admittedly, there are other things going on with Russia and Saudi Arabia, as well as the, 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 the COVID thing, but you can see it definitely did not follow suit. Uh, natural gas and electricity benchmark there, if anything, went up, which makes you, uh, I posited this some 10 years ago at a similar event. Uh, I think a lot of other people said, I don't know who said it first, but when you think of fracking and producing crude oil, you're essentially subsidizing a massive glut of natural gas. So natural gas prices in the spirit of negative prices have routinely been printing negative in Texas because there's so much of it there, it, it's being subsidized by crude oil. One might conjecture, and I'm curious to hear people's reactions, that the drop in crude basically has impacts on how much production is gonna occur in crude oil and actually results in less gas being produced. Maybe that's what's happening. And finally, uh, this is a catch-all. Uh, there's uh, no need to really go into it. The response of renewable energy credits, thinking of sort of uh, that, that sector, has, was volatile, but uh, kind of ultimately didn't change very much, much to my surprise. And um, same is sort of true with capacity markets that we can go into later if people feel like it. The one thing that might segue naturally, what Mike's probably going to talk about a little bit, is uh, the, what happens to the, uh, the, the oil producers. And these are CDS spreads. Uh, and this was as of, the blue is as of the beginning of the year. And this is Occidental Petroleum. It's uh, definitely not being viewed horribly favorably by the, uh, by the street or the traders anyway. And um, uh, United Airlines, of course, is faring substantially worse. Argentina, if you want to know, was about here, way up about four times higher. But it's still pretty ugly for these guys. Um, that said, uh, handing it over, I think, to the next uh, panelist. Great. Thanks, Glenn. That was, uh, that was very interesting, too. Um, so then uh, the final panelist uh, is Mike Lukowski, Professor of Statistics and Applied Probability at UC Santa Barbara. Uh, so over to you, Mike. Thanks for doing this. Thanks, Rene. So um, I'll, 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 I want to talk about two, uh, Rene, sorry. So I want to talk about two topics today. Uh, one is about um, real options and the durable impact of this uh, shock in Southern about uh, California. Um, so the, the, we just witnessed a huge shock, um, both from the demand side and from the, um, I guess, demand on, on both uh, oil markets and electricity markets. And uh, this was alluded by, by, by previous uh, panelists. Um, and I think that these are durable shocks. This is not something that's gonna disappear quickly. And so if, if you're coming from a stochastic modeler's uh, perspective and used to thinking about things like, such as uh, real options, it's quite interesting to understand what's going on. Um, so I have two um, references to two different Bloomberg articles from uh, last couple of months. So the, the one side is talking about what's happening in the oil markets. And essentially, um, it's not clear who is going to be the winner, winners and the losers in the long term from this huge um, price shock. But it seems to be that um, the shale oil actually is, is, is well positioned to benefit because it's, it's extremely flexible. Um, and so it, it actually is, it's, it's, it's easy to shut off and it's easy to, to start back up. And as a result, it might actually come out stronger than ever before. Um, and so the, one of the, um, the article was talking about that potentially, um, you know, the Texas will actually be a winner uh, rather than the, um, let's say, Russia um, in, in the long term. And I think and from, from a stochastic perspective, it's interesting to understand how asset flexibility is, is playing a, a huge role here. Um, on the energy, electricity side, um, Glenn talked about um, the, 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 the you know, reduced demand, demand destruction happening. Um, and um, again, the, the impact on the long-term impact is, is, is very different. So this chart shows that, in fact, the demand for renewables is likely to still increase this year, while the, the people who are going to be um, shut off and probably permanently are is coal and, and oil, uh, the, the fossil generators, because they have high operating costs. And once you shut them down, once you most ball, it's extremely hard to restart back. Um, and so, in fact, you know, it, it seems to be that you know, this, this demand shock is actually going to um, move forward in terms of the, of the green, um, greening the, the, the grid. Um, on, on the California side, uh, I wanted to, 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 to break the point. So um, California is now has a very high percentage of renewables. And uh, we're looking at, uh, in, in April, it was uh, close to 70%. So this all charts from the California ISO. And um, this, you can see the slide as well um, right now. So I, I could flip, uh, I could show you the web page about how it looks exactly today. But this is from last week. This is from last Friday. May 22nd, and you can see a few features here. 
So one of the unique features is that um, the, the net demand in midday was around 21,000 um, megawatt hours, and the net demand was, was le less than half of that. So, so more than half of this was kind of from renewable generation. And so this, this, this huge penetration of renewable is, 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 is happening now. Um, and so this curve here, was, that's what people call the duck curve. And essentially you can see what's happening on the supply side is that during the day, um, the renewables are dominating, and this is pretty much all solar. You can see from the from this panel here, it's all solar. Um, wind is just a little bit there, but the, the, the this 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 obvious you know daily seasonality of solar is causing everybody else to scrape the bottom of the barrel, and this is in fact happening now daily that we have curtailment. So there's too much generation of 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 renewables during the midday, and so th this is just being um, curtailed manually by the by the operator basically be for multiple reasons, but essentially for um, not to have too many negative prices, not to have too much congestion, because it's all coming from the desert, um, and not to have too much of this um, ramping up in the afternoon. And so these this multiple effects are, are happening now already you know, daily, um, and this was predicted for many years, but again, it's accelerated now with this demand destruction. Um, and I had a, actually a different slide I'm not gonna show right now, but um, about the fact that this is, this is a, if people start working from home um, in, a, in a permanent basis, there's going to be a dramatic shift in how the um, demand is, is happening on a daily pat pattern. That's going to affect the duck curve as well. Um, so I have a couple of slides. Just talk briefly about, you know, from the research perspective, how this, what, what is happening on the research side, how to capture all this, all this phenomena. Um, so you can see uh, Renee's name mentioned multiple times. Uh, there's two reasons for this. One, it seems to be that in the, um, Quantitative finance communities is, is the French teams are sort of ahead of the uh, ahead of the pack right now. Um, in US, it's mostly done by people in OR um, and um, um, and other in other fields, not not in, not not as much going to finance. Um, and now, of course, the other reason that Rene has a convenient uh, name starting with A, so he gets to be the first author in lots of papers. Um, so um, it's certainly mean field is a huge is 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 a major trend that sort of inter intersects really well with this all this energy market behavior because there's a lot of um, stra strategic behavior and a lot of interaction both on the producer side, everything from OPEC to um, how to um, you know congestion of the of the of the electric grid due to putting all the solar and wind uh, plants in the same uh, locations geographically. Um, to the on the on the on the uh, demand side, um, anything from people having to you know buying electric vehicles. And mass and how that affects um, the market to, um, to to doing what's called the demand response, where now we can actually flip 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 the picture instead of having um, su uh, supply following demand, we have the demand essentially following supply because you saw in the previous plot the renew the solar generation is extremely noisy um, daily. You can see it here again; it, it really fluctuates a lot, and you have to you have to be able to 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 follow that essentially. So. Um, I, I, the, the, you know, energy market has always been about strategic interaction. This happens on every level from the classical exhaustible resources. Um, I think we seem to be beyond peak oil now um, due to demand issues rather than supply anymore, but still that's, that's, that's very much of a, a, a game theoretic issue. Um, technology, um, again, there's a lot of spillover effects um, that, that are, you know, lend themselves well to captured by, by game theory. Um, capacity, um, congestion on the grid is, is, is very much a, a mean field effect. Um, everything with electric vehicles is, is a mean field effect and so on. Um, and the last point I have is about the, the, the time scales involved. So this, you, can, you, can, you can think of this problem as on, starting from the very large, very long term scales, um, you know, the climate change effects um, to the really short term scales of, of how the, the, the price formation is, let's say the electricity price formation happens. Um, so if, if you really want to get the um, get out of your comfort zone and, and get your hands dirty talking to people from other communities, um, energy finance remains to be the um, one of the interesting places to, to be because you, you really have to do a lot of statistics these days to, to handle this, all this data that comes that can, you know especially for renewables. Um, you, if if you want to understand how the um, especially as electric works, you have to understand the power power engineers and, and how the optimization is, is, is run um, and a lot of numerical uh, problems that, that crop up. Um, both from the mean field side or from, from games or from um, stochastic modeling. So I'll, I'll just stop here with a uh, uh, shout out to the uh, mini symposium that Ronnie and I are organizing at the, in July at this uh, virtual SIME annual meeting, financial math track. Thanks. Great, thanks, Mike. That's uh, very interesting as well. 
Um, so we have a couple of questions. Let me encourage everyone um, just to type a message in the chat if you uh, wish to ask uh, a question. Um, uh, let, me, let me go to the first question that we got, which is from Babak Zafarizadeh. Uh, so Babak, if you're there, I'll unmute you and maybe you can turn on your video and um, ask your question. Babak, are you there? Okay, I'll read out his question and if he, if he jumps on, um, we can um, uh, have him say it. So the question to all panelists is, most real option valuations assume log normal, i.e. always positive prices. With the recent negative oil prices, uh, as we've heard, should we reconsider stochastic price models? And I think this relates to a broader question that was touched on by a couple of the panelists. Is this a once in a lifetime or is this something that we should consider is going to happen? Uh, you know, should we upend uh, you know, many of the procedures. I think Zef seemed to imply this was a one-off. Uh, Rene uh, seemed to apply, imply, maybe I'm misunderstanding that this force majeure is going to be uh, maybe removed from futures contracts as a provision if this kind of thing is going to happen. So I don't know if the panelists uh, would like to address that question. Please just jump in. Sure. Yeah, I, I would uh, like to just say that uh, uh, it's probably less likely to reoccur, but I would not say it's impossible by any means. So I think we do have to account for the possibility that it could potentially go negative again. Uh, unless the CME puts in some structural changes to redesign the contract. I know they're looking at that because uh, really the front month contract has little significance with the underlying economic value. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, redoing the pricing models, that's essentially what's being debated. It sounds like uh, we probably need to, you know, uh, rethink this. And I'm not sure anybody has a great answer at this point, but I'd love to hear uh, the audience's opinions on what may be a better way to uh, model uh, negative strikes and maintain uh, uh, historical sensibilities. Can I make a comment? Yeah, please. Yeah, I, 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 we th I tend to think of the world as, as, as separating benchmarks from um, basis locations. And the, the, so this question is probably, not to put words in the box mouth, but probably related to benchmarks. And you would expect a benchmark rarely to explore negative territory. It just seems uh, uh, alarming to say the least. The, the other way negative prices arise is simply due to examples like I mentioned, like subsidies, like production tax credits and electricity can make for negative prices in West Texas. It's a rational thing. Same with negative Waha prices and natural gas. So when we think of modeling those, those locations are often they're less liquid. Uh, you, you ostensibly have forward marks, but you certainly don't have ball marks. And so uh, we, we, we model those explicitly as spreads to benchmarks. And the way we do that, details don't particularly matter, but they're amenable to negative prices. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Glenn. You know, I, I was mainly referring to the futures benchmark. The physical markets obviously can definitely go negative. And, and he has a very valid point on uh, gas and Waha, for example, being subsidized. And we do price spread options. We've done that for a long time. Uh, uh, cross commodity spreads as well as time spreads. And uh, it, we've essentially used either a Bachelier or a Kirk model, uh, which uses a normal distribution and allows negative prices. The, the whole question is how to take the traditional uh, option valuation metrics from the past and make it uh, have it make sense in an environment where you now have negative prices. I think that's what uh, I I, um, I Love to hear if there's a better answer. Great, Renee or Mike, do you have anything to add on that topic? Uh, not on that topic, because for for my concern is more like a, a very rare event, and the question is more like how quickly can you adapt your models? For instance, the the thing is I don't know about price model for the pricing of uh, for in fact the the price forecasting to make the generation management plants and, and stuff from one day to another. But as uh, Glenn showed that the, 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 the error forecast for the demand increased a lot. We had a talk by uh, David Benassia who was studying the error forecast of, uh, of, the, of the demand in, uh, in New York for the New York market. And it, was, it increased a lot and it took time before the scheduler can 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 understand the new shape, the new shapes of, of, of the demand. 
So I think that the, the main question is how, how fast can we react when you are faced to a system like this? Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks, Bobak, for the question. We have a few more. So next, let me go to Wenxin Zhang. Um, and Wenxin, do you, uh, I've unmuted you if you want to say your question. Uh, yes. Uh, so my question is, uh, as the economic is reopening, do you expect that uh, the demand for electricity is recovering? And how long do you expect that to fully uh, recover? Thank you. Glenn, do you want to take that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. By the way, I apologize. There's some lawnmower that just started up, so I'll try to talk over it the way it works. Um, the, you know, I, probably there are various views around this, and it's really hard to know. If you look at the, like the forward price response I was showing for power and natural gas, that looks sort of benign, same with a few other measures. Uh, you have to bear in mind, though, and this is where um, I, I'm, I'm bearish, unfortunately, is that I would argue we never really recovered from the credit crisis. Um, you, you had the Federal Reserve with uh, a, a new normal for its balance sheet of trillions of dollars, puzzlingly, at the end of last year, I think, uh, prior to this whole, whole nonsense. So um, e, 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 another thing that's relevant is that we know from looking, here's an example. We, we, we work with a client, a retailer, that is no longer retailing. They just, they just bit the dust a few weeks ago uh, to give you an idea of how rapidly things change. And they were heavily CNI, commercial and industrial focused in the New York City area. And, but we were looking at a lot of their data. So this is data streaming in that's interval data. You get it almost immediately. And if you think 20% is bad for many of the businesses, and it was a large number, it's way worse. Uh, and there's a hysteresis ultimately, like if these, if these businesses go kablooey, they don't just pop up again. They're not like uh, shale gas where you ramp them down and ramp them up. Uh, I, so I, I, th I personally think it's going to be a long time for us back to normal. But most of my peers are more optimistic than that, I must say. Okay. Anybody else want to comment on that? Yeah, Renee. Uh, for this, I, I agree also with Glenn. I think that we are going to be a recovery in two steps. So first, it's just like you imagine that you had a fracture and then you have to go for some time. You you are stuck and you cannot move, and then you have re-education. And uh, if you make the comparison, sometimes you don't recover fully what you, your capacity that you had before. And this is what we were going to observe. In fact, in France, we, the, the lockdown uh, stopped in May 11th. It's now for more than 14 days, and the consumption is, is still at the level of 40 gigawatt. It does not recover the 60. So we asked, why is that? It's because the industry has, has, has closed because all the non-necessary industries, they had to, to, to put some special plans to allow people to go back to work. And so in fact, there are two things. When the authorization are going to be there and when people are going to be able to reopen industries. And in fact, there's a lot of conversation about Renault, a big factory of cars here in France. And uh, okay, they want to put the, the the, the, the factory back on track, but then they have to, 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 to protect the, 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 the workers and so, and so there, there are problems like this. So they have to defer the moment where they can open. Okay, but these ones, they're going to reopen. So when they reopen, you're going to see the increase and in the recovery of demand. But in the meantime, as Glenn said, some people collapsed, some people went bankrupt. So these ones, they are not going to reopen quick. So for this one, no demand. And so, to, I think there are just going to be first, I, I guess, 20, you're going to, to recover maybe a large part of your consumption, maybe by the end of the, of, of, the, of the year. I don't expect that by this summer, but the end of the year, and then you will still have a deficit. And this deficit is going to be very long to recover. Great. And then we have a related question uh, uh, directed particularly to Mike. Uh, so Scott Cogswell, um, if you want to say your question. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for interesting talk. Uh, we saw the curves of the sort of hourly demand during uh, in, in New York and how you know, the bankers are setting their alarm clocks for an hour earlier. I work for a bank and I'm set my block one o'clock for an hour earlier too, but I'm in London. We, we uh, I was wondering, but you showed us, you showed the, had the charts of the, the solar, the supply of solar during the day. 
I was wondering if people who are working from home are using more electricity, keeping their air conditioning on in California than they would if they were in the office. Mike? Yeah, so I think that's exactly right. So um, if I can just share my screen for a second. Um, so, so this is a picture from, I mean, maybe I've seen this before. This, this is, uh, was put out uh, from, from Austin, Texas. This is not California, but it's exactly what's happening. There's a flattening of the curve from people working from home. And this definitely a residential AC is more, went up dramatically and, it's, and it's, it takes up more electricity than um, commercial AC. So, um, you know, there's, 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 I think there's more demand residentially, as you can see in this picture. And also there's more flattening overall of, of, of this duck curve. Um, and so this, 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 you know, they, these people have seen more better than anything from, you know, more use of refrigeration to, um, you know, people, ch people changing their daily pattern and, and kind of spreading things out, you know, going away from the nine to five situation. Um, but this is all, you know, this, this, this data is about what happened in the, in the middle of the shutdown, how it's going to change going forward is really unclear, um, but lots of people are trying to figure this out. Is this graph just commercial, uh, sorry, residential demand or? Yeah, Beacon Street, I think, is a startup is trying to do demand response. And so they can directly collect data from it. This is only a few hundred houses. This is really small. Okay. Um, yeah, but this, I think it's all people who have solar on their, on their roof and they're under some contract with this with the startup. I mean, I had maybe the same question for Glenn, like you're showing these graphs of demand destruction. Was that both residential and commercial or just uh, commercial? No, the, 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 the demand destruction was uh, the sum of the, the bunch. Uh, it's harder to get to, without work. We, we see it, and that's why I put in the, the, the qualitative statement that what we see for CNI was substantially worse. The, the, what's essentially happening in the East anyway is there's more residential demand. It's changed the, 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 the shape, but it's been more than offset by destruction elsewhere. Um, and that goes to how Renee, uh, Renee's comment about how long it continues. Um, okay. We're looking into trying to do it, to break it apart. There is some data available that it's generally hard to get hold of for us. Okay. Does uh, anybody else have a question on Scott's comment? Or Scott, do you have a follow up? Okay. No, no, thanks. That's my question. Okay, great. Um, all right. So then the next question is from Stefan Sturm. Stefan? Yeah. I wanted to ask, there was a lot of uh, rumors that there was some market manipulation involved with the negative oil prices. And actually I heard two different rumors. The one that there was a lot of basically a cost sell-off while the people who were selling off had at the same time covered their positions in the traded settlement uh, book and in this way basically causing the traded settlement price to crash. And on the other hand side, there was a rumor that there was a lot of storage in Cushing, Oklahoma, bought and not actually used, uh, so used for mainly speculative purposes. Is this something what you can probate or which is wrong or any other thought about this? Maybe Zef, do you want to address that? Uh, sure. So it's it's very hard to prove any kind of manipulation. Uh, I'll uh, definitely you know say that I've, uh, I've had some experience with inquiries in this regard. Uh, and uh, in in terms of uh, uh, so essentially it it seems like uh, I, I would call it a series of market anomalies. I mean the fact that people were able to put on long positions with almost no margin was definitely an anomaly that should have never been allowed to happen. And, you know, physical players, quite honestly, saw an opportunity. They saw, uh, you know, the retail tourists uh, uh, through retail products uh, stepping into the space as well as uh, non-professionals essentially trying to buy oil at uh, uh, what they thought was a low number, not expecting it to go negative. And uh, uh, if you're in a capacity to have have the physical optionality, uh, you would definitely take advantage of that situation. And, and, the, and, the, and the people who, who got run over mostly were, let's just say, highly inexperienced and uh, some of the financial institutions whose systems didn't live up to uh, the adaptation they needed to make. The CME had warned them about five days before that prices could go negative, but five days wasn't nearly enough time to uh, rebuild their systems to account for margining in this situation. So I think it was a combination of uh, retail people coming in and buying a commodity that they thought couldn't go below zero 
and uh, you know physical players who did have access to Cushing storage. That storage essentially gives you the optionality uh, to either take or receive barrels. Uh, and uh, if you see, you know that essentially that May June time spread went blew out to. Uh, sixty dollars essentially, which is a completely ridiculous number, much more so than the negative oil price, and uh, they took advantage of it. You know, and uh, uh, it's uh, it's a situation that I would think people would take some precautions against in the future, including the exchange and of course the brokers. Uh, does any of the other panelists have anything to add on that question? Okay, then we have a question which I think is a comment on um, Mike's. Uh, previous answer from Corey Hedman. Uh, Corey, would you like to go ahead? If he's still on. Otherwise, I can read it out. Corey, are you there? Okay, I'll read out Corey's question. So, or comment maybe. Uh, utilities are seeing a reduction in consumption. The uh, load pattern reflects a weekend day for electric power consumption, which is less. Uh, the pecan street is for a particular load types, so I would not extend that for all. I'm not sure if I um, said that correctly. Mike, do you want to comment on whether, the, you know, what the pecan street chart is particularly showing? Yes, yeah, so I, I agree with Corey that, you know, the, the general trend is that, you know, there's no the, the distinction between weekday and weekend is, is kind of being erased, at least temporarily. And the Beacon, Beacon Street chart was for residential loads, um, so not not fully representative of the whole market. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Corey. Uh, so maybe next, uh, let's go to Kaisa uh, Taipale. Kaisa, are you there? Oh, great. Hello. Um, I'm in the freight industry, which is a little bit different, but certainly um, we care about oil prices, among other things. And I'm wondering to what extent you've looked at causal impact and Bayesian techniques for your time series analysis. Maybe Glenn? Uh, well, I guess the short answer would be uh, not, um, but probably closely related matters. I mean, we're always interested in, in uh, here, here's an example. Let me just like shoot something out and see what your reaction is. If you we're often hampered by um, uh, the level of data that's available, especially when you move away from electricity markets. So, you know, the electricity markets were designed in an era with you know, IT, they had to be high frequency because they have to be reliable. And it was a, it was a modern construct. If you go back to natural gas, um, there's a, it's, a, it's a lot harder to know what's going on. So for example, utilities are loath to really tell you what's happening to individual customers. So what we do is we, Hoover up large amounts of customer data and we proceed to uh, cluster it, if you will, in a, in, a, in a reasonably sophisticated way so that we can pull out different groups of customers with their idiosyncratic behavior. So I don't know if that's pertinent to what you're saying, but frankly, Bayesian, no. In-house, we don't use anything Bayesian to my knowledge, not because we have a fundamental predilection against it. We just, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's just not, not what we do. Um, that was at least a start to an answer, hopefully. Okay, Renee or Mike, do you have anything to add? No, Renee, no. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, so we're almost out of time actually. Uh, Corey had added a comment that residential is roughly one third of overall load. Um, and uh, commercial and industrial loads are substantially down. So the overall load is down. Utilities are reporting loss of revenue due to reduction in consumption, which I think um, confirms what we saw here. Uh, okay, there is a question. Uh, maybe this is the last one or two from Maxime uh, Bichuk. Maxime, do you want to go ahead? Um, sure, thanks, Ronnie. Um, I guess a question to, uh, I don't know, Glenn, Mike, uh, maybe uh, Renee too. Uh, Zef, um, I guess mostly it's, it's, it's electricity mostly, but in addition to the destruction of demand that you've seen, right? Do you guys anticipate a congestion distribution issue? So, for example, uh, the demand in uh, New York City uh, used to be, or uh, supposedly used to be, from big offices, right? So, very, very central, let's say mid and lower Manhattan, versus now it's residential, i.e., Bronx, Brooklyn, uh, Queens, so uh, outboroughs. Uh, that, that, I had not thought of that. That's a that's a really interesting point. I mean, 
this may be not what you're referring to, but, but certainly the losses that you ascribe to delivery to, we'll call them residential profiles, are typically substantially higher than for CNI. I wonder if that has something to do with the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the increase in residential consumption. It's intriguing. Uh, as far as, uh, I haven't looked, for example, at congestion contracts between uh, say, you know, Zone J and some Brooklyn node. It's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, so, no, thanks for asking it. I can't do more than that. I think it's a, worth looking into them. I, I think it's mostly a, a longer term question because, right, the, what you expect is that, um, you know, people will be um, really adjusting their pattern. And, you know, I think now we're still in this, you know, strange shock period. And I think longer term, you know, lots of people are wondering if, if are people going to move to the suburbs or we're going to have in a different way, whereas the load is going to be, um, or the you know skyscraper is going to be less used. So I think we'll see, I think it'll take a few months or years to actually see if they, they, they really. Yeah, happen. although you can you can interpret the question. I mean, it's short term because it's uh, I've never even looked at it, but you could immediately see right now if you see any change in the dynamics of congestion prints essentially that they as they electricity prices are decomposed into sort of the mothership price losses and congestion and some ISOs and you might be able to see something even now. It's kind of a, kind of curious, um, but yeah. So I, Mike, I agree with your question long-term for sure, but even right now you wonder if they're encountering any issues that we haven't noticed. Okay, great. Well, we're essentially out of time. So let me thank everyone for the questions. Uh, let me thank the four panelists, uh, Mike, Renee, Glenn, and Seth for doing this. Um, we've, uh, we have a few, uh, minutes uh, afterwards, some of the panelists may be able to stick around for other questions, and we'll uh, stop the recording uh, at that point. Um, and uh, for the science series, we look forward to seeing you again in two weeks' time. And uh, uh, another note is, um, as we're adapting to this format, and it's uh, kind of a long-term format at the moment, you know, please send Igor or myself or Agostino um, uh, a, any suggestions how we can improve the format uh, either in these panel sessions or in the regular regular series. So let me stop the um, recording. The, Igor, is there any administrative announcement? No, that's all we have. Uh, as you said, in two weeks, we'll have uh, the next talk by Patrick Keredito. And as always, the alternating weeks the Bachelor of Finance uh, Society has their own seminar. So next Thursday, same time. And I don't remember who speaks there, but probably it is uh, Nizar Tuzi, I believe. So that's all. And stick around for half an hour chat. Uh, uh, administratively, just tell us if you want to be promoted or you want to speak. And of course, we'll unmute you and you can turn on your mic and video. Okay, and I know if, if, if the panelists can stick around this query, I know some of you have to go. I know it's late in Paris, but uh, uh, thank you again. All right, so let me stop the recording and then people can just jump in if they want to chat. <laughs>